January the 4th, 1995. I'm on a flight to Miami. I have two unlimited Amtrak tickets for two months travel across America. I have a few clothes, two sketchbooks, pencils, pens, watercolors, a compact camera, and a tape player with a pink electronic game on the front, don't ask. There's a small screen in the back of the seat that offers in-flight entertainment. I've seen all the movies except Milk Money with Melanie Griffith. Here I am imprisoned in chairs and clouds. Nine hours, 57 minutes of discomfort. Isn't being an air stewardess supposed to be one of those dream jobs? <sighs> I'm not sure it'll be first on my list. Finally reaching the airport in Miami. I find myself in a huge expanse of concrete darkness, blinded by the headlights of buses, cars and taxis. Where on earth am I going? I change some big notes for phone money and look on the information board and book a room somewhere in Miami Beach. Now all I've got to do is get there. I take a taxi with a very talkative driver who gives me the guided tour as I stare out the window at all the lights and architecture. And you see that purple lit building there, he says. That's Don Johnson and Melanie Griffith's penthouse at the top. Now I wish I'd watched the movie to put this site into perspective. And there are some of the renowned Miami Vice alleyways, he continues. I'd not watched Miami Vice either. So it was all lost on me. Arriving at the Miami Beach Tropics Interclub, my sightseeing trip was over. Checking in, the room was simple but heavenly after memories of tired and anxious people staring at revolving baggage. January the 5th. I wake at 3am thinking it's time to get up. Get up, get out, draw. I was enthusiastic to sketch all of my travels. But something is wrong, it's dark outside. I look out of the window at the odd car passing and two men shouting obscenities at each other in an amusing manner. Wide awake, I draw the view outside the window. Buildings, the street lights, the cars, and the two men arguing. I aim to record this experience through manual processes, through drawing, through writing. The camera is for emergencies only. Soon I hear some Germans arguing in the corridor outside. It would be interesting to know what it was about. Uh, I should have paid more attention in German lessons. Oh, I just remembered we only did French and Spanish, and I wasn't very good at those either. At seven o'clock... I walked along the beach by buildings approximately the same colour as dolly mixtures, pastel pinks, yellows and blues. I was excited by the abundance of palm trees and started drawing them. My illustrator friend Jamie had been copying them from photos, so I felt pretty superior drawing a live example. But the excitement really started to reach a crescendo when I found a coconut on the ground. Hearing the milk sloshing about inside, I tried to get into it but despite kicking, stamping and violently throwing it onto the tarmac, just wouldn't crack. When I spotted the familiar sight of Woolworths across the road, I was reminded by a chap on the plane who had told me that Woolworths was different in America, in the sense that it was incredibly tacky, and so I couldn't wait to get inside and see what he was talking about. After being somewhat disappointed by the level of tackiness in Woolworths, I ate at a Mexican fast food restaurant called Taco Bell. It was tasty and reasonably priced. A perfect combination for an adventurer on a budget. With renewed energy, I went for a long walk along the boardwalk, past luxury high-rise departments, past people lazing about swimming pools, jogging with G-strings and skin like leather. The roads just seemed to go on forever. And I walked and I walked and I walked and generally realised what David Byrne and Talking Heads were going on about. I was literally in that song. I was heading towards downtown Miami, but soon realised that being a pedestrian on these roads puts you in a minority. January the 6th. Being budget conscious, I had checked out of the Tropics Interclub and into the Miami Beach Youth Hostel. Cheaper, but you had to share a dorm room. Anyway, I woke up at 3am again and spent a while concentrating on sleep, imagining walking down a road to nowhere. Then, just as I was on the edge of sleep, an alarm clock went off somewhere in the dorm. This alarm just kept going, but nobody claimed it as their own. Perhaps the owner had died in his sleep or become immune to its mildly irritating beep. Eventually, one annoyed roommate searched out the location of the offending article, but discovered that it was locked in a suitcase. He then located the offending owner, woke him up, 
who then proceeded to spend ten minutes looking for the luggage key himself. At last there was silence, but the damage had been done. During breakfast I decided that Miami was not for me and made the decision to leave it way behind. After a bus ride and a train ride, I found myself waiting by the roadside on the dusty outskirts of Miami, looking for another bus that would tenuously take me to the Amtrak station. As I waited, a man, far in the distance, sauntered closer and closer. He came through the traffic and across the road, both decisive and laid back at the same time. Eventually, when he arrived, he asked me where I was going in his soft and dangling manner and his one immediately distinguishing characteristic was that he had coins wedged into each ear, two shiny 25 cent pieces that stood out round and silver in his dark ears. I tried not to stare and never plucked up the courage to ask why, phone money perhaps. I was nervous in this unfamiliar environment and I said that I was trying to get to the Amtrak station and he didn't hear or understand at first but reassured me that the bus would be along soon he then sauntered back across the road and out of sight so i waited and i watched the traffic beneath what i thought must be the bus stop i had become more and more inclined to feel i was on some kind of wild goose chase in the wilderness with such an absence of buses and some while later the sauntering man with the quarters in each ear returned and told me that the Amtrak was a turning on the right, and I thanked him, and once again slowly he disappeared out into the heat haze. As I waited, eventually something oasis-like began to materialise in the distance. Yes, it was a bus that would take me to the Amtrak. And after a few problems with my train pass, I found myself on a train bound for New Orleans. When I climbed to the top of the train, it was Friday, and I was struck by the space and the comfort. It felt nice, stretched out, watching the world go by, high up through the window, knowing I was definitely going somewhere, and not in some land of purgatory waiting for an imaginary bus. Rusty old buildings, breakers yards, weathered industries, and the rear ends of businesses. It was indeed heaven, and my adventure had properly begun.